Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm Anna Harvey, president of the Social Science Research Council. And it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 SSRC Fellow Lecture. Our fellow this year, whom I'm very happy to introduce, is Pratap Mehta, the Lawrence Rockefeller Professor for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton University. Pratap was previously Vice Chancellor at Ashoka University, a private liberal arts university in India, and has also served as president for the Center of Policy Research in Delhi, as well as a faculty member at multiple universities around the world. His areas of expertise include political theory, constitutional law, and society and politics in India. He's the author of numerous books, which I won't embarrass him by listing, has served in a number of prominent policy roles in India, and he's an active participant in Indian public affairs, including writing a regular column for Indian Express. Pratap is going to talk to us today about universities and intellectual life in the age of populism. This is a topic which, if you read the news, Pratap has had, as well as I suspect many of us, firsthand experience. It seems that every week brings a new story about a conflict between academic values and political majorities. This week, it happens to be the University of Florida in the crosshairs. Next week, I'm sure we'll have a story about a different source of tension. Pratap is going to try to help us put these tensions into some kind of broader historical and comparative context and think about where we might be headed. After Pratap's lecture, which will last about 45 minutes, we will have the very good fortune of hearing thoughts from Ira Katz Nelson. Ira is the Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History at Columbia University, to which position he has only recently returned after serving as Columbia's interim provost. Ira is also, of course, a former president of the Social Science Research Council. We call him 13 around here, and we're so glad he's joining us today. You will see a Q&A box uh, on your Zoom screen, and at any time, you can enter questions there for Pratap or Ira. After we hear Ira's thoughts, we'll all three come onto our virtual stage, and I'll read off questions from the Q&A. We're recording this, the entire event and the recording will be posted for those of you who have to drop off early. On a more personal note, Pratap and I both arrived at Princeton University at the same time um, many years ago to start our doctoral degrees in the politics department there. And we spent the next five years together in a series of basements. So during the day, you could usually find us in the basement of Firestone Library. And at night, you could find us in the basement bar at the Graduate College, which was, for those of you who've, who, who've been around the campus, it was a, appropriately named the debasement bar. And I have some very fond memories of my many conversations with Pratap from those years. And I particularly recall conversations about a book that had come out only a year or two earlier that had an analytical introduction that completely reoriented the academic debate on how to think about political movements that arose from economic anxiety. And that book was Working Class Formation. And the author of that analytical introduction was Ira Katz Nelson. So today feels for me very much like picking up a conversation that we left off some 25 years ago. Pratap, I'm so glad to be welcoming you here today. The floor is yours. Um, good evening, good morning. Um, thank you so much, Anna, for that uh, characteristically uh, generous and warm uh, introduction. Um, I should also say that uh, the topic for today's lecture uh, was also at Anna's instigation. Um, uh, originally, this fellowship was supposed to be, uh, I was supposed to be working on populism and then I have a couple of uh, more rigorous academic articles coming uh, out in that in a couple of months. Uh, but I think in conversations with Anna, I think it became clear that it'd be a good time to reflect on uh, the relationship between what I mean, what I mean uh, and uh, university life in general. Um, it's not a topic uh, that has received as much systematic academic attention. And so this is in a sense, a first cut at that. Um, and it's a reckless cut. Uh, it's it's a sort of, you know, 30,000 feet high rumination on the relationship between populism and universities uh, in very many different contexts. Uh, 
um, uh, but but I know with 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 Ira as a discussant, and partly I think I wanted to kind of provoke Ira. Uh, I thought it'd be good to, in particular, focus on some possible comparisons between India and the United States uh, at this juncture. The two cases I'll be talking about the most. Uh, but I hope what um, there are some relevance uh, to different contexts across the world. So if you glance at news from across the world, uh, you might be forgiven for thinking that a new specter was haunting universities, or so, so, excuse me, a new specter was haunting the political world. The specter of the university as a potential threat to society, or at least some academics as potential threats to society. In country after country, politicians, and I have to say at this historical juncture, largely on the right, in tone about universities harboring dangerous ideas. Uh, the French higher education minister was famously quoted uh, as saying, Islamo leftism corrupts all of society and universities are not impervious. But that statement was not atypical of our times. The contagion has spread far and wide. Uh, you can cite lots of instances from politicians in Poland, Hungary, Brazil, Denmark, and Netherlands. In India, the idea that many universities harbor minority appeasing urban Naxalites bent on subverting the Indian nation is quite central to the ruling ideology of the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is in power, and has often led to attacks on universities, in some cases with students being charged with sedition. Turkey and Hungary have seen large scale purges of academics, if not whole universities. And in a very different setting, even the Chinese universities seem to be getting more tightly under the gaze of the party than they were perhaps over the last 10 to 15 years. And most surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, the United States seems to be undergoing an unprecedented battle on whether certain programs or theories can be taught with state legislatures weighing in. States like Georgia and Florida now seem to be at the forefront of undermining ap academic freedom. And as John Aubrey Douglas pointed out in a recent edited volume called Neo-Nationalism and Universities, Populists, Nationalists, and Autocrats seem to be asserting their political might over universities. Now, it might be tempting to dismiss these as flashes in the pan. It's a bit like crying fire in Noah's flood. Uh, and this is a charge that often is leveled against people who worry about uh, freedom of expression. Um, this is you know, this was Macaulay's critique of John Stuart Mill, for example, in the 19th century. Uh, after all, many universities are flourishing, more people are entering higher education, and much of the work of academic production goes on unabated. Even censorship seems to be, in some cases, very hard to enforce. In fact, one of the paradoxes of censorship in a modern context, in a contemporary context, is that it often seems designed less to suppress information, ideas, or arguments than to call attention to something so that a political identity can be organized in opposition to it. So these frequent demands for banning are not so much about the idea that in some senses you can kind of extirpate them from the discursive world of ideas. Uh, it is more that by calling attention to them through demands of censorship, you actually mobilize a certain kind of political opposition against those ideas. Now, the countries that I named uh, are all very different, even amongst the democracies. Uh, there are a great deal of differences. They have different political systems. The degree of institutional and legal protection that academics get varies. The financing structure, a critical variable in thinking about the relationship between universities and populism varies across time and space. And of course, the cultural milieus uh, differ considerably, and, and, and I certainly would not want to minimize those differences. But one of the things that has struck me in reading about the history of the relationship between universities and politics across the world, particularly the United States, Britain, India, uh, Eastern Europe, to a certain extent, Brazil, is that at least since the late 19th century, universities across the world have shared a kind of aspirational isomorphism. Uh, Calcutta University, let's say in the 1920s, and John Hopkins could not be more different in many ways. And yet both shared an affinity 
with the Humboldtian vision of what a university might actually look like. And what is, I think, of interest at this particular moment is also the ideological isomorphism of the attacks on the university and their simultaneity. It's almost when you sometimes read accounts of attacks on universities, you could actually just take paragraphs uttered by politicians in Denmark and attribute them to, uh, let's say, a politician in India. You could attribute some of Mr. Erdogan's actions to perhaps Bolsonaro's. Uh, and this is what I sort of mean by ideological iso isomorphism, that there is a kind of remarkable sort of consistency in the themes and the ways in which this opposition to universities is being organized. Uh, what is interesting about this moment is that often what separates autocrats from democrats in their critiques of universities is the degree of institutionalized power they have, but not the ideological impulse from which they seem to be attacking universities. Now, the attacks on universities in the name of populism can take many forms. Uh, sometimes they're just political attacks that are par for the course, but do not fundamentally alter the structure and functioning of universities. But often they are attacks on academic freedom. In many countries, they're purges of faculty, more attempts to exercise control over the curriculum, wrest autonomy away from professors. Uh, one can just a whole range of instruments. Right? But again, what is I think interesting is that behind all these instruments, as I'll try and show, is this interesting discursive function that the following idea performs, that the university could be a potential threat to whatever the political system uh, happens to be. Now, what I'll do in the next few minutes, uh, very quickly, just to give you a roadmap, is I'll try and do two things. First, I'll give you a very, very quick and 30,000 feet sort of perspective uh, on a kind of history of populist challenges to the idea of university, drawn largely from the United States uh, and India. And although I'm drawing from these two histories, I'm using these histories more as metaphors because you will find the same kinds of arguments, uh, political strategies repeated all across the world. After giving this brief history and arguing that this history actually tells us something important about uh, the ways in which universities have faced kind of challenges over the years, I will come to this particular ideological moment that we face in the present and try and pick out two themes that seem to run in critiques of universities across different geographies, Brazil, India, United States, Turkey, Hungary, uh, uh, sort of Poland, and then try and ask some questions about how we might think about right, uh, these, this particular ideological con configuration and challenge, uh, uh, challenge to the universities. Before I jump into the argument, I also just want to add a couple of historical caveats since I'll be rushing over a lot of material uh, 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 pretty quickly. Uh, first, I have to say that it's hard to quantify uh, the extent of the attack on universities. Um, I have some data which we can share with you in terms of, you know, there are organizations collecting, for example, instances of attacks on academic freedom across the world. Uh, and you could argue, looking at that, that data, that just in terms of numbers, if you just add up numbers, uh, the numbers don't look as alarming as you might say. You, could, you know, going, going back to the argument I made, you know, are we crying sort of fire in Noah's flood, as it were? But I think what intrigues me, I think, about many of those instances is, I think, the chilling effect that even a small number of instances on academic freedom in the name of a popular will can actually help, uh, can have on universities. Uh, in some contexts, uh, to paraphrase what Yale President Charles Seymour said many years ago, we may not be seeing as many witch hunts because there are no witches left. And certainly I think if, when I look at the Indian data, uh, you could actually argue that the number of instances, serious instances uh, of let's say populist attacks on universities may run into a couple of dozen. 
but the chilling and conforming effect they've had on the rest of the universities are quite quite startling. Um, but as I said, I'm, I'm at the moment not kind of sort of concentrating on the magnitude of the problem, at least as understood in quantitative terms. Now, since the late 19th century, as Bill Reddings in his uh, really quite prescient book, The University in Ruins, uh, reminded us, uh, there are broadly four self descriptions that were assigned to the function of the university. And again, I want to stress this point that these functions isomorphically come up in discussions of universities across geographies. Uh, you read a convocation address, let's say from 1927, Mysore University, Sarashutosh Mukherjee, one of the great founders of Indian universities. Um, and you pick up any random convocation address about the mission of a university from the United States in the 1920s, they're almost uh, substitutable. And the four descriptions assigned to the universities, the four, you might say, elements of a mission statement uh, that were spelled out are as follows. First, the universities, of course, often paid lip service to Cardinal Newman's idea of the integrative function of the university that the function of a university was to, in some senses, integrate various forms of knowledge into some kind of architectonic structure and linked that to the cultivation of a higher personality. But I think what is striking about the invocation of Newman, Newmanian ideas in some sense of the university is that I think they were in some senses articulated more as a gesture than meant seriously the idea that anyone had ever become whole or virtuous or that knowledge had become whole or virtuous by virtue of universities was a hard one to sustain even as early as the 1920s. And even by Max Weber's time, when Max Weber is you know, sort of talking about uh, uh, his, his great essays on sort of science as a vocation, I think this idea had been more or less given up on. Instead, what we get is three very different strands uh, that are very central to thinking about the modern liberal university. The first is the liberal strand, which emphasizes a subject striving for intellectual autonomy, freed from all constraints uh, of tradition, of state, and even of capital, romantically speaking, engaged in a form of self-discovery driven by, as it were, the requirements of reason itself, right? The second strand, not incompatible with the first, is a little more watered down version, which is looking at the university uh, as a collection of disciplines, each governed by their own protocols of inquiry and often subject to the calculations of utility. So the university is a bunch of collection of disciplines. They each have their own protocols. It's a much more kind of professionalized image as it were of the university. And the third sort of element of the statement, which is quite common across all these geographies, is that the university is the site of the creation of some kind of national culture uh, that would be the bearer of some kind of universal spirit. The German, the Indian, the American, each jostling to embody the universal spirit or the idea of reason. Uh, the university would be a space in some senses where the individual found themselves engulfed in some kind of a nation, national culture. And the national culture was taken to be both the precondition of the aim of universe and the aim of those universities. What is also striking, I think by the 1930s and 40s, um, is a sense of the sociological reality of the universities. Uh, and I particularly want to highlight, I think, two claims that come up quite frequently. Uh, one is the obvious one, which becomes very prominent after World War II across the world, that historically universities have been marked by deep exclusions uh, in the United States of religion, race, gender, class, in India, caste, class, gender, all kinds of exclusions uh, that in some senses question this idea of the university as a kind of free space. Uh, in which all could participate in this voyage of individual self-formation and the journey of reason. 40s, 40s and 50s, there's an articulated, I think, claim made about universities, that universities were a haven for potential troublemakers, 
uh, uh, and, and what do I mean by this? Um, if you remember uh, Roger Kimball's book uh, that came out a few years ago, a couple of uh, maybe decades ago, Tenured Radicals, uh, Roger Kimball sort of tried to, in some senses, create a sense of alarm that professors were radical. But of course, the joke was that the radicals were rendered safe by granting them tenure. They might have occasional corrosive effects to their teaching, but these corrosive effects could be neutralized by the power of the broader culture. And on this view, one of the latent functions of the university was in some senses to de-radicalize and pluck from their organic context intellectuals who otherwise would have per probably performed the kind of function that the Fren French intellectuals did in the 18th century, going about stirring trouble, creating revolution, um, and rendering them somewhat conservative and pillars of the establishment by placing them in universities, right? In this sense, the university was also a containment exercise of sorts, where professors functionally became the pillars of the establishment, while at the same time, they became a sign of the establishment's generosity, its ability to take on broad criticism, so long as, of course, that criticism did not really matter politically. Now, it's against this backdrop that the university, of course, has been historically uh, questioned. Uh, the shadow of populism has accompanied, uh, as it were, the, you know, the institutionalization of the modern university in different ways. The American populist movement uh, of the early 20th century, as Scott Gelber's Brooklyn study of populism argued, uh, was a interesting moment in thinking about the relationship between populism and universities, because then the populist movement uh, made three legitimate demands of the university. The first was expanding access to the university. Can universities genuinely be the people's universities, right? Who gets access to these universities? Second, that populist movement questioned the knowledge hierarchies that marked the traditional university. So for example, can vocational knowledge acquire the same social status as in some senses the traditional Humboldtian university did, right? But the third, I think, related thing that that populist movement in some sense has put on the agenda was a desire for greater popular control of the university. That populist movement was a classic anti-elitist movement, but it was an anti-elitist movement in the name of deepening and broadening the university, not of destroying it. And historically, when one thinks of populist revolts against universities, they have primarily focused on the demand of expanding access and questioning hierarchies of knowledge. In India, for example, at one level, uh, the kind of politics that Indian universities experienced in the 1960s and 70s, which were forms of populism, centered precisely on this, uh, expanding uh, access through affirmative action. Uh, although in India, affirmative action means expanding access for the majority, not, not expanding uh, access for a particular minority. Uh, because affirmative action is organized along caste lines. Uh, there were demands for vernacularizing Indian universities. Uh, the idea was that in some senses, the elite universities, because they were structured by hierarchies of knowledge and particularly marked by the use of the English language, were excluding large swaths of students. Uh, and in that sense, they were not people's universities. There was a sense that you wanted to make them popular uh, uh, universities. Uh, and if there was a populist sensibility in those movements, it was the mobilization of some kind of resentment against elite universities, uh, that they were not genuinely people's universities. So that's kind of one strand, the anti-elitism expand access in some ways. Can universities be genuinely people's universities? The second strand in populism, in some or a different kind of populism, a more sinister one, uh, in the United States was of course exemplified by McCarthyism, the hunt for enemies of the nation and the charge that the ideological affiliations of faculty and students made universities potentially the site of seditious behavior. You might say this is the strand of populism that emphasizes some kind of national interest or national loyalty test. 
And this is the strand of populism that has in some senses increased with enormous virulence, uh, not perhaps yet in the United States, although I think it'd be interesting to watch, but certainly across, uh, across the world, uh, where the populist claim is that the universities need to be held accountable for something like a national interest or national loyalty interest. The third sort of interesting stand, uh, and perhaps the most powerful one for, uh, I think, my story, uh, was, of course, the student revolts in the late 1960s and early 70s, uh, all across the world, which, in hindsight, can be read as attempts to reposition the university as some kind of a populist institution. Uh, in some senses, the students' movement of the 1960s in Europe, in India, arguably even in the United States, was calling the university's bluff. It presented its, itself uh, against the moral barrenness of a university that had deprived itself of substantive moral and political commitments that flowed from, uh, as it were, the will of the people. These movements were in part an attempt to position universities as a kind of vanguard in political struggles. The formalism of the acquisition of knowledge had to be complemented with substantive political commitments. And these commitments often derived their legitimacy by allying with wider social movements uh, that would in some senses bridge the gap between theory and practice that had always marked the university space, right? In some senses, what the political movements in universities in the 60s did was actually put into question the condition under which universities were tolerated in the first place, that there indeed be a gap between the theories that professors and students profess and actual political practice. The 60s and 70s breached this contract in a massive global upsurge of university politics. University, university activism, activism across the world had many different sources, anti-imperialism, anti-militarism, civil rights, sexual liberation uh, in, in, in some contexts, particularly in the United States and Europe. Uh, in India, the universities had already become a site of political ferment in the late 1960s with the alignment of student politics with party, partisan politics. But by the early 70s, the universities were also at the forefront of a kind of anti-authoritarian politics. Uh, and in fact, it's that anti-authoritarian politics that bequeathed an entire new generation uh, of politicians in India. In West Bengal, uh, in particular, the university became a site over pitched battles over Naxalism uh, after the victories of the left front government. Okay? So in some senses, since the 60s, you have this attempt to position universities as some kind of vanguard uh, or political vanguard of a certain kind, at least. Now, this brief history already lays out some of the different kinds of challenges that universities have faced under the name of populism, or at least challenges that are said to be articulated in the name of the people, uh, anti-elitism, uh, the worry about potentially seditious behavior, where certain kinds of nationalism becomes a litmus test, a certain kind of suspicion of the university as a site of a cultural vanguard, where universities progressively transform identities in the direction of, uh, let's say, greater sexual liberation. On this view, what was wrong with universities was liberalism was no longer about toleration or letting different kinds of people find their own measure it became a cultural project of sorts, of cultural transformation. And you can see the echoes of that in contemporary debates. And overlaid on all these three anxieties was a nagging anxiety about the university as a secular in institution. Uh, think of William Buckley's great creed, uh, great, I'm using sort of ironically, God and man at Yale, which described the university as destructive of religious tradition. And amongst other things, called on donors to assert, assert greater control over the shaping of the agenda of the university. But in India also, if you read texts from the time, the relative marginalization of texts of Indian culture and Indian religion uh, was a recurrent theme in the politics of the time. Uh, people often pointed out that it was easier to read an essay on Freud on the Ramayana in Indian universities, but not read the Ramayana itself. 
and outside of the hallowed portals of elite universities like Jawaharlal Nehru University or Delhi University, uh, the sense that the university was a site of a certain kind of cultural deracination uh, was quite prominent. But what the 60s and 70s did, as the great Alistair McIntyre pointed out, was created the conditions for a permanent external critique of the university. The universities across the world emerged from the experience of the 1960s and early 70s as permanently suspended between, as it were, two very different kinds of dangers, right? Either they were accused of hypocrisy. So these are universities that profess DAS capital by morning, but engage in capital accumulation by night, or they were perceived as dangerous if they did in fact try to bridge the gap between sort of theory and practice, right? Uh, and in some senses, I don't think the universities have quite overcome this, this in a sense, permanent uh, uh, tension where from an external point of view, either they almost always come across as hypocritical, right? Uh, which is uh, somehow unaware or unwilling to acknowledge the material conditions under which they exist and the tension between those material conditions and what in senses, ideologies, arguments and ideas that they profess. The second, I think, sense in which the 60s, I think intellectually, besides this gap between theory and practice, I think the legacy it left was that it did leave a very powerful sense amongst the universities uh, about a consciousness about the degree to which injustices were meted out to different groups historically and how the university itself often was a site of those uh, injustices, right? But what it also in some senses created was a certain kind of skepticism that the claim that the universities had that some kind of open-ended inquiry could by itself produce a rational consensus turned out to be a false. While universities may profess to be open-ended, right? Uh, in some senses, follow the rise of lines of reason wherever they might lead, in practice, most, most universities were governed by large exclusions of different areas of inquiry. If you were inside a university, there were no grand conspiracies in these exclusions. Academics often move in cabals, methodological fashions. Uh, in Indian universities, for example, uh, the big fights were between two factions of the left, uh, CPM academics versus CPI academics. Uh, and their battles were far more intense the than the battles between them and let's say members of the right wing, if you're talking in ideological terms, uh, or they were often sort of, you know, serious methodological disagreements. Uh, so in some Indian universities, for example, uh, the study of political institutions were, was seen simply as an epiphenomenon. Um, and therefore these departments were staffed with people who by and large studied only social processes. And you can see the Marxist provenance of, in some senses, you know, the constitution of those departments. But I think what these disagreements, I think, brought home was that most university departments were in practice parasitic upon some kind of prior agreement upon the aims and methods of inquiry. Uh, and these often limited diverse frameworks, uh, as it were, from uh, being institutionalized uh, in the university. And this persistent kind of charge in some senses that the university claims to be this open-ended space, but in fact, uh, uh, it, is, you know, it isn't uh, in some ways. Okay? Now, this ferment, as I said, so this political ferment uh, left the university dangerously kind of hanging between either people thinking, thinking it was dangerous or people thinking it was hypocritical, right? Uh, this paved the way for two kinds of thinking about universities. One in countries like India, and this, this is a small example I just want to use because it becomes significant later on, uh, was a serious attempt by certain political parties uh, to think of the universities not as autonomous spaces, but as genuinely as institutions that needed to align themselves 
with the purposes of the state. So the most egregious instance of this was uh, the left front government in West Bengal, which first perfects the idea of a party state, the idea that there needs to be some kind of ideological alignment of civil society actors and autonomous institutions within the broad ideological purposes of the ruling party. And on this view, if the party is the people, partly because it gets legitimation through an electoral process, you know, it has the imprimatur of the people behind it, the universities have to become one with the people by aligning with the party. And the left front's reconfiguration of the relationship between the state and universities in some senses became a model or a template uh, that contemporary right-wing political parties in India in some senses aspire to. I mean, it's a kind of milder version of what the Chinese Communist Party tries to do in terms of thinking the relationship between universities and societies. But that's, that's a story in a minor key. The bigger story in some senses that came out was an attempt to deflate the university. Uh, this was the view that rather than attributing the four grandiose aims that I identified as kind of characteristic of universities in the 1920s and 30s, the universities should be best seen as simply a conglomeration of professional functions, right? Universities should not be seen as great agents of change. Uh, professors as prognosticators are of course terrible. And it's better to find meaning and heroism in the hum humdrum professionalism and the parochial and boring protocols uh, of university disciplines. But the interesting thing I think about this attempt to deflate the claims of the university was that it also had a big populist imprimatur behind it. And I'm going to give this populist imprimatur a name, namely, I'll call it the Reagan Thatch Thatcher moment, uh, a 15 to 20 year process that were arguably still continuing. Although this is a point that is seen as a, as the inauguration of a neoliberal turn to the university. Uh, I do think the legacy of that Th Thatcher Re Reagan moment was quite significant in thinking about uh, the contemporary I think, moment in populism. Very quickly, and I'm using Reagan Thatcher as a metaphor. I mean, again, you'll find the same isomorphism running uh, across universities uh, in the world. So the Reagan Thatcher moment positioned itself ostensibly against the vanguardism of the leftist university of the 60s and 70s. Uh, in this view, the people, the real people, were pitted against what Ronald Reagan famously called a small minority of hippies, radicals, and filthy speech adv advocates who should be taken by the scruff of the neck and thrown off campus permanently, quote unquote. Right? So the people against some kind of intellectual vanguard. The second element in this reaction against the Vanguardist University was a demand for public accountability. In principle, the demand for public accountability is a perfectly understandable one. Uh, if taxpayers are funding the university or tax exemptions are be granting to university, you, you know, it's quite legitimate to say, shouldn't the university be accountable to somebody? But it opens up the question, how is this public constituted to whom the universities are accountable? what notion of the public is relevant here? And I think the crucial move that Thatcher and Reagan in some senses made, at least in their articulation about university life was that the figure of the academic can no longer be the arbiter of the public in some senses. In some ways, what they peddled was the conceit that if you were looking for a real test of the public, what constitutes the public, the real public, the test was actually to be found in the market, uh, in the concrete economic demands being made in the university, in the allocation of capital, in donors. Uh, and in some senses, they juxtaposed this conception of the people, right? The real people, the consumers, uh, as against the vanguard kind of, you know, the academic as a kind of vanguard representative of the people. This shift, had profound consequences for thinking about the structure of education. 
So you have the foundation for the relatively diminishing importance of public education. And one of the, again, the striking things uh, post sort of Reagan and Thatcher globally is you have a rise in the share of private institutions. Now in the United States, of course, private institutions were much more prevalent, uh, but in the rest of the world, the balance of enrollment shifts quite profoundly from public to private institution. And the data that one has shows that student protests come down quite significantly in most countries across the world. But one of the curious things I've come across that the explanation in the right-wing circles was that one reason student protests were coming down was that they were being made to pay high fees, right? Uh, this was similar to other processes in terms of the contractualization of academic appointments and so forth. But the idea was in some senses to undercut right, the idea of a professoriate uh, or an academic class, in some senses, laying claims to being a vanguard on behalf of the people. Right? Uh, so in some ways, and, and, and one, when one think of the Reagan-Thatcher moment, it was a kind of populist revolt with the impulse of disciplining the universities, except that the, the, the means they used to, in some senses, discipline the universities, uh, was in some senses by subjecting them to uh, a much more marketized uh, conception of, of, you know, of, 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 you know, of the university. Now I'm actually going a bit slower than I thought, so I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of uh, skip over to the contemporary moment a bit. But the one I think big takeaway I'd like us to think about from this history, uh, uh, I think which is quite, uh, I think significant is that the framework that the Reagan-Thatcher moment bequeathed, I think to most of the world, uh, was premised on, I think, two salient propositions. The first was the political neutralization of the university, right, uh, in some senses. Uh, and the second was, and this is, the, this is a point I want to emphasize that, uh, sorry, uh, excuse me, sorry, I just, uh, was, okay. So the two big legacies of the Reagan-Thatcher moment, first was in some senses the attempt to politically neutralize the university. But the second, I think, interesting consequence of that movement was that that was also the time where the universities were becoming open spaces in a very different kind of sense. Uh, over discrimination, norms of discrimination, particularly around religion, race, caste, and so forth, at least over norms of discrimination were being put, put aside. And all kinds of groups were being included, at least formally, in the structure of the university. Now, this process of inclusion required the university to engage in two kinds of negotiations. The first was a renegotiation within the university. Uh, about the new norms uh, in the culture of the university itself. And some of these debates were in some senses quite healthy. It led to debates over, for example, how the past is represented, how canons are structured, and how the universities fit into national life, right? And so the terms on which university and university curricula were articulating collective identity were being radically renegotiated, right? But I think the understanding always was that the terms of these renegotiation, right, had to in some senses honor and respect what were currently prevalent and dominant national myths. That in some senses they should not uh, stand in the way of, uh, you know, uh, the university performing its function as being the purveyor of some kind of collective uh, you know, national identity or national life. Now, it is this settlement in some senses that begins to, I think, unravel over the last 10 to 15 years. And what you find 
by way of attacks of the university is a new ideological configuration uh, emerging that I'll just go through uh, very, very quickly. So if you look at the contemporary moment and the attack on the university, there are two central elements in this attack. The first is that the university is a source of new social divisiveness that disturbs the unity of the nation. Contrary to the general assumption often made, uh, at least in the press, uh, that populism is a revolt against globalization, what you find in contemporary critiques of the university is actually not so much a critique of the university positioning itself as part of a global elite. Uh, in fact, contemporary populists are in some senses often quite comfortable with the technocratically cosmopolitan character of the, of the university, right? What disturbs them more is that the university is no longer tied to any national cultural mission. It does not link itself uh, to inherited national identities, and it does not form the kind of historical consciousness that could be put in the service of national unity. The charge is not that universities are in league with foreign power or a rival imperial ideology. It is that the university stands against the idea of the nation state ideology itself in its respect, in, in, in many respect. It stands against its conception of the people. It stands against its dominant historical myths. And often it has a kind of anti-military uh, sort of sensibility. And intellectually, the, the way in which this charge is articulated is that the universities have given up on the promise of liberation inherent in the nation state. But they've given up on that promise, not in the name of some emancipatory cosmopolitan identity, because that myth was already busted in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it is that they have given up the project of liberating individuals from ascriptive identities and melting them into larger entities where the circle of their sympathies can be united into the common cause of the nation. Instead, the universities are now committed to seeing the nation as nothing but a series of contesting parochialism, different group identities jostling for power. The university is in effect, the site where reason and identity are being collapse, collapsed. The motives perhaps behind this collapse might be worthy. Uh, it's to draw attention to uh, the nation's historical exclusions, but its net effect is to reproduce and exaggerate antagonisms within society, to reproduce a whole series of dualism that threaten the unity of the nation. Uh, you know, it can be race in the United States, it can be caste in India. In this way, the contemporary populist critique of the university trades on a particular psychological gambit that it's quote unquote the left that believes in a certain kind of sociological determinism. Whereas it's the right that accords dignity to agency by having a conception of political identity that is much more generative. It constructs the nation, whereas the left deconstructs it into its constituent groupings in the name of caste, race, ethnicity, or gender. Again, I think what's important here is not the accuracy of this description, but its function in thinking about the relationship between knowledge produced in, relation, in, in universities and wider identities. Now, behind this claim, there is, I think, an interesting paradox, which is, if you look at the contemporary right and populist movements, at one level, they are hyper-constructive. And I think that's something that has given the right a particular kind of energy. Whereas left social movements, in a sense, some sense have some senses been caught in the grips of a certain kind of sociological determinism, right? An alliance of particular ethnic groups, an alliance of particular classes uh, might produce a social movement. The right, in some senses, I think has been much more active uh, across different geographies in thinking about how identity can be, in some senses, constructed, right? But it takes on a constructivist view of identity only if the constitutive elements of that particular nation's groups can be, in some senses, deconstructed and remobilized into the service of this larger common national identity, right? The Indian, 
the Hindu, the American in some senses. Uh, what the right refuses to do is of course, famously extend this hyper-constructivism to the issue of personal choice. And I think this is most manifest, for example, in its treatment of gender. Uh, uh, so at one, at, at one level, while the right wants to contest this idea, right? Of in some senses, reason and politics being overdetermined by identity, right? In the case of gender, it wants to, in some senses, reinstate it uh, in, 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 you know, in, 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 in different ways. But the central claim in some ways, right, that the university has become unmoved from its mission of generating a form of collective identity and has dissipated that project into a series of overdetermined sociological parochialisms. Absolutely sand standard trope, whether you're discussing Brazil or Turkey or Hungary or India. The second element, so this is, this is sort of the one kind of, you know, new uh, uh, element in this. And as I said, it's, it's an attack on the university, not in the name of uh, its cosmopolitanism, but in the name of its particularism. The second strand of attack has, of course, become the idea of academic freedom itself. This is the biggest weapon in the populist arsenal. And there are four different charges uh, against universities. The first charge is that on the academic, on the ground of academic freedom uh, is hypocrisy. Uh, universities do not extend the courtesy of academic freedom to rival viewpoints, frameworks, uh, and especially political convenient ones. The second charge level on the grounds of academic freedom is the opposite, that academic freedom is often a ruse to disable the state from fighting against those who are out to subvert it. It is a form of tolerance that protects the intolerant. This was a charge that was already made by William Buckley many years ago, that it was liberals more than communists who were the bigger threat since they used academic freedom as a shield to protect against pernicious, protect pernicious doctrines. So in this view, once it has been determined that a particular ideology X, let's say Islamism or Naxalism, is a fundamental threat to the ideology of the state, academic freedom comes in the way of protecting the state. So if the constitution is not a suicide pact, how can a university or the idea of an academic, free, or academic freedom be? The third charge, in, is that what is often sought in the name of academic freedom is something more than academic freedom. It is the protection of activities, writing, form of thought that are by their very nature not academic. In some ways, this is a charge that trades on a distinction that is often made between academic freedom and broader freedoms more generally. Fine, right-wing populists say we grant academic freedom. But if it turns out that the boundaries of academic freedom are narrower than those of intellectual freedom more generally, those boundaries can be used to curtail subversive intellectual inquiry. You can probably see this perhaps in the University of Florida case. And fourth, the doctrine of academic freedom is used in a populist idiom as a kind of figure of the evasion of, pub of public accountability. It's a privileged exemption from having any kinds of questions asked of professors, perhaps even students. Either academic freedom serves the public good in some broad sense, in which case one opens the door to the asking whether any particular exercise of that freedom does serve the public good, who are academics accountable to, what in some sense makes this charge rhetorically appealing is that it constructs the academic as the, the figure who needs to be held publicly accountable. How can there be a public interest that is not decided by the public? And who better represents that public? The political class that is finally accountable to the real people or the academic who's decided in advance that their practice is actually in the public interest. Okay. Now, what gives these two strands, right? The university as a kind of assault on the nation state ideology and the hypocrisy of the doctrine of uh, uh, academic freedom. A particular charge is the anxieties over national security 
created by the post 9-11 world. The war on terror in psychological terms, at least in countries like India has become a generalized condition where it has become possible to discursively link local dissent and configurations of conflict with transnational fundamentalist forces. So this claim that academic freedom protects the intolerant in part gets its charge and draws its anxiety from this, you might say, elective affinity and association. This is particularly acute in the case of India, where, for example, Kashmir becomes a litmus test for not just national loyalty, but a commitment to fight terror. And there's no Indian university practically now where you can hold a frank seminar, for example, on, on Kashmir. And lastly, in the case of India and China in particular, there, are, there is one other consideration that is relatively new. Both India and China see themselves now as at, at the forefront of a product of decolonization in some authentic uh, sense. And certainly Hindutva and right-wing nationalism in India presents itself uh, as a form of decolonization, right? Uh, what that means, we can, we, can, we can discuss how performative it is, uh, how much of a gesture is it, we, we can discuss later in some senses. But one of the implications of seeing universities at the forefront of a kind of indigenous decolonization project is that these political projects also want to take these, this aspiration global. So one of the things that you've been seeing in American universities, for example, is threats to academics, both by Hindutva groups, and of course the Chinese government in very different ways is actually asserting, right, in some senses, uh, its rights over academics who even read and write and practice uh, uh, in, in, in the West. Uh, this particular kind of assertion is motivated by the sense that India has arrived at a moment where it is in a position to challenge the epistemic authority of professors, particularly in first world universities. And my sense is that this aggression will outlast the present political regimes in India and China, where there will be more and, more and more demands for scholarship globally to be made accountable to concerns over the standing of these civilizations. Scholars of Indian traditions and Chinese traditions will be subject to these populist uh, popular specials. Okay. So as you can see, in some way, I think the universities an interesting and to my mind kind of delicate uh, political conjuncture globally, where the popular appeal, right, of the standard populist critiques of universities uh, anti-elitism, enlistment in the cause of the real people, where the identity of that real people in some senses is defined uh, by the populist, right? Uh, the attack on academic freedom as in some senses a ruse for protecting uh, uh, privilege and the unmooring of university from national life are going to in some senses be staples, I think of our political discourse. The actual effects of these movements will vary considerably. Uh, I don't have to kind of time to go into the depend on, of course, partly the success of these populist movements. Uh, you'll get a whole range, uh, I think, in countries like Hungary and uh, arguably in Turkey, you've already seen the institutionalization of party states where universities are meant to, in some senses, carry out the mission of the dominant party. I think India is very much trending in that direction. United States arguably has much more political competition. And so we may maybe save this fate. So we can talk about the actual political and institutional circumstances uh, that might determine the success or failure of this critique. But there is no question to my mind that I think this critique is raising unprecedented questions uh, for the universities. Uh, what has not helped, I think, is that in the public mind, the university itself, the credibility of the universities outside of its narrow professional function uh, seems to have considerably de deteriorated 
they are no longer seen as exemplary sites, uh, 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 exemplifying the values they profess in, in the ways that I actually described. And in some senses, it is that gap that as Alistair McIntyre had pointed out is the biggest fuel for populist politics, right? Uh, the perceived double standards of universities. So the big challenge for us is under these circumstances, what is it going to take the rest to restore the credibility of the university such that it can more effectively and credibly manage these populist attacks? Uh, the university is certainly not going to disappear. I think the prosaic professional functions of the university, which is 95% of what universities do, uh, are in demand enough and powerful enough for the powers that be to want to preserve them. But certainly I think profound questions are going to be asked about the mission of the university. And I think the tragedy of our time is that the universities are not exemplifying what might be a convincing answer to those questions. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry I've gone on too long. Um, Ira can make more sense of all of this. Well, uh, dear Pratap, uh, thanks so much for this um, urgent and learned analysis of the present collision between forms of political assertiveness and our universities. You might think of retitling your talk as uh, between danger and hypocrisy, um, which is where you position the danger of the university. And thanks to Anna for, um, uh, for pulling us together um, and for designating me as number 13. Um, so I thank you as number um, uh, 15. Now I share, Pratap, I share your concern for how universities are being um, designated within a stark friends versus enemies set of understandings as, as the enemy that's uh, discontented, disloyal, disruptive, that has to be constrained and properly redirected. I, I should immediately say that my remarks will be a lot uh, more provincial than yours. I've spent some 10 days of my life in India, have never been in Brazil, spent time in Hungary and Poland primarily before and just after the pivotal year of 1989. And hence my thoughts are primarily oriented to the American experience as we think about what is new and particularly threatening in what you Pratap designate as the age of uh, populism. And my approach in these uh, comments will be indirect. Um, uh, Pratap's reflections have brought me to a number of texts from the past that may help offer a vantage on the present. One of these is the University of Chicago committee document written nearly a half century ago. Uh, the other is a text by three Columbia faculty, uh, distinguished faculty from the past, the generation of my teachers, uh, Robert Merton in sociology, Richard Hofstadter in history, Daniel Bell in sociology. And finally, I, I will bring uh, to the table a particular feature of Hannah Arendt's analysis of racism and anti-Semitism in her uh, book, uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism. But what exactly is under threat? And I think we can, um, it's summarized for me by uh, the Committee on Academic Appointments led in 1972 by Edward Schills, a distinguished sociologist, a committee that included uh, John Hope Franklin in history, uh, Sanders McLean, a wonderful mathematician, and a good many others. And that report led to a robust faculty discussion in 1973, the year I arrived at that university as a young faculty member. The existence of the University of Chicago that text opened, I'm quoting, is justified if it achieves and maintains superior quality in its performance of the major functions of universities in the modern world. First among them being the discovery and teaching of important new knowledge. Now, um, I could linger there 
superior quality, who judges, what is it, what is its range, what indeed is the scope of the new knowledge that was being pursued. Um, here, here has lied, um, here is laying the, the charge of hypocrisy that came later. But the report crucially turned to matters of collective culture. And it's that collective culture that's under assault. And I quote, a university faculty is not merely an assemblage of individual scholars and scientists. It must possess a corporate life and an atmosphere created by the research teaching and conversation of individual scholars, which stimulates and sustains the work of colleagues and students at the highest possible level. And it's just this cultural configuration that's under various forms of popular political assault, some from inside the university. And if we are to act to secure this intellectual academic culture, as I hope we would, we first must believe in it, understand why it is fundamental and designate elements that are so essential they cannot be compromised. And that brings me to Bob Merton. Uh, writing in 1942, a time Merton identified as marked by incipient and actual attacks on the integrity of science, Merton penned a short and still powerful essay he called A Note on Science and Technology in a Democratic Order, where he stipulated four binding norms that undergird the vision for colleges and universities that were later articulated in the Schill's report that I just quoted. And Merton explained why within these norms, the quest for knowledge and understanding thrives best within liberal and democratic circumstances. And here are his four norms. The first he called universalism. And I quote, the canon that truth claims, whatever their source, are to be subjected to pre-established impersonal criteria consonant with observation and with confirmed knowledge. Second is what he provocatively called communism, appropriating the word to refer to the common ownership of systematic knowledge, just the opposite of secret and closed systems, placing a premium on open communications, robust debate, and a liberal and communitarian testing of claims. Third was what he called disinterestedness, by which he did not mean not caring about meanings or norms or impact or concern for humanity. The term for Merton simply meant following rules that minimize unethical research and teaching behavior and limit the influence of bias of all kinds, including bias that would restrict access to the community of scholars and teachers. And fourth for Merton was what he called organized skepticism as an institutional, personal, and methodological mandate. Question, is this model inherently anti-system, anti the people, potentially dangerous, inherently hyper hip hypocritical? Of course, my view is no. Even as there was much exclusion much social and economic elitism as distinct from intellectual elitism when Merton wrote. But a university without those four values would be something of a travesty. Now near the end of his essay, Merton limpidly observed, quote, the temporary suspension of judgment and the detached scrutiny of beliefs in terms of empirical and logical criteria have periodically involved science. And he might have said the modern and primarily secular and open university is in conflict, as he wrote, with other institutions. Universities press hard to ask questions about facts and values, he wrote, concerning every aspect of nature and society. And thus, he wrote, they are likely to come into conflict with other attitudes toward the same matters, which have crystallized and been ritualized by other institutions. And by those other institutions, 
he certainly meant states and churches, business firms and social movements, political parties and the media. And these other institutions, he cautioned, as he concluded, will persistently try to extend their control over the creation and dissemination of knowledge. His last sentence observed, referring to Berlin, Moscow, and Rome in 1942, how modern totalitarian society promotes anti-rationalism and the centralization of institutional control with the effect of starkly limiting the directions and scope of intellectual activity. But that designation, much like the one Pratap has offered today, presses us to ask not only what is new, but to ask which pressures are endemic and local. It was Richard Hofstadter in 1963 in Anti-Intellectualism in American Life who underscored an enduring tension in democracies, enlarging on insights found in Tocqueville that concern tensions inherent in the democratization of knowledge. Hofstadter defined anti-intellectualism as, quote, resentment of the life of the mind and those who are considered to represent it and a disposition to constantly minimize the value of that life. Formal knowledge and expertise are thus devalued. From that vantage, he wrote, intellectuals are thought to be pretentious and snobbish, very likely immoral, dangerous, subversive. His book pursued two goals, to explain why the intellectual life is a positive good for liberal democracies, but also to explain why in democracies, threats to intellectual life will never disappear. The Schill's report, University, is necessarily elitist, inevitably a thorn in the side of many who live and work in a mass society. And the liberal university with Merton's values is doggedly secular, a challenge to spiritual and, theoretic, and theological orientation, not least the deep strands of Protestantism that have dom that dominated colonial America and well beyond. And then there was Daniel Bell's 1974 Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism that stressed the degree of autonomy of three large structures, the economy, the state, and modern culture. And he designated the latter as inherently anti-rational, anti-cognitive, anti-intellectual, prone to apocalyptic moves. So what is new? Which elements of economy, culture, and state constitute our deep present dilemmas? And it's here that I think Pratap is precisely on target when he stresses matters political. There are, of course, fundamental trends at work in the economy, in civil society, in the wider culture, indeed within our own universities, that pose powerful challenges with a strong family resemblance to the dangers identified decades ago by Hofstadter. But of course, with present day particularities and twists, not in my view, neoliberalism as such, but the effects of market radicalism on social structures and opportunities, which have widened the gulf and limited the chances for those outside elite higher education. This development has gone hand in hand with the near death of private sector unions, certainly in America, and the ladders of mobility they help secure and protect. In the domain of religion, we've witnessed the decline of mainstream Protestant churches in America and the rise of evangelical forms of belief and worship, creating alternative university structures grounded in particular spiritual and policy commitments. In the domain of communications, we increasingly are bombarded by non-curated information and misleading claims to fact. The anti-intellectual the anti trends that haunted the generation of my teachers have deepened with these features. And such trends, as I said, have not been absent within, from within our universities, both on the right and the left of the ledger, but that's a subject for another day. In these 
circumstances, today's circumstances, the university inevitably appears as an instrument of division. As a footnote, I might simply urge that we understand that there are many ways in which our universities have become much stronger. They're more international, they're more cosmopolitan. They once were bastions of exclusion, but they've shed religious, gender, race-based barriers to entry, not all, but most. Faculties have expanded. The subject they, they, we research and teach have extended. Universities have better connected curiosity-based knowledge to attempts to grapple with large public challenges like climate. Yet, the threats identified by Pratap are very real and good outcomes far from assured. What then is distinctive about the present beyond the cultural, economic, and social dimensions that I just noted. And here I want to conclude by following the trail of Arendt, who understood that anti-Semitism in her day or before, and before her day, in the late 19th and early to mid 20th centuries, became lethal only when it became state-sanctioned political anti-Semitism. And what is new today lies in the sphere of anti-liberal politics sanctioned by state authorities, a politics that shows no respect for the rule of law, for individual and collective rights, for the separation of powers, for limitations on actions by rulers. We are experiencing a powerful constellation of political division at the liberal and illiberal divide marked by a willful disregard of truth and verification, the deliberate mobilization of faith and anti-group hatred oriented to play on and underscore status anxieties as inequality grows and mobility pathways close at the same time that racial diversity has increased. In short, and I end with this, illiberal democracy is the threat with the shrewd manipulation of the values of popular sovereignty, political participation and mobilization. This situation is different than the one universities faced in Poland or Hungary under communism, or that they confront today in Putin's Russia or Xi's China. There we see direct unmitigated authoritarian censorship and oversight. Our problems are embedded rather in a constellation of anti-intellectual cultural passions, economic unevenness and political opportunism as political leaders, prime ministers, presidents, members of parliaments, leaders of parties, orient their popular and populist appeals with tools of command and the framing of opinion in ways that mask and hide and fool as enhanced democracy while actually threatening its essential fundamental foundations. The crisis of democracy, sorry, the crisis of universities, thus is the crisis of liberal democracy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ira and Pratap um, for such an interesting an illuminating conversation. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to, I'm looking at the Q&A box and I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here that we've gotten from Jane Mansbridge um, and David Hollinger. And the question is about, um, the combined question that I'm gonna to offer to you guys is, what, what's our response from within the university community? So Jane asks about um, the, the, the meaning of the word accountability. So accountability can mean that we give an account of ourselves and our practices, right, along the lines of what Ira has just, you know, articulated as the core intellectual values of a university that are, are we, are, and David asks a version of that, which is, are we, are we giving an effective enough account of ourselves and our practices? What, what is the account that we can give? And Jane also asks, to whom? What's the, what's the relevant public here? So if either of you want to maybe take a crack at that. So who's taking a crack? Go, go ahead. Why don't you start? Um, okay, uh, 
two quick thoughts. I mean, no, no, the, the, those are wonderful questions. And thank you, Ira, for as always uh, um, a brilliant intervention. Um, so I think one thing, I think, I mean, I think Jane's question first, which is, I think one of the things that actually makes this moment fraught is that the answer to the question to whom should universities be made accountable is actually being answered in a populist vigilante idiom in some senses. I mean, we could you know, traditionally sit down and say, okay, who are the stakeholders? Who are the constituents? What is the balance between different constituents? Uh, but in some senses, I mean, I think just building on Ira's argument, I think the, the, the element when we say accountable to the public, who is this public and how are they constituted, right? Uh, the political force of that public, the people, the American people, the Indian people, whatever, is in a sense being constituted now through the activity of populist politics itself. So I think, I think, I think, I think that's I think what I, I think links Jane's question to question to Ira's comments in some ways that uh, we are not asking that question in a context where the kinds of institutional checks and balances and conversations that we used to have, we could take for granted. I mean, you know, balance between students and donors and alumni and, you know, wider society and sometimes even university bureaucracies. Um, so I think, I think it's precisely that question that what that actually gives the populist, uh, I think, up, you know, upsurge its edge. I think on David Hollinger's question, which is in some senses related to the truths giving account. So I also agree with Ira that at one level, universities are stronger than they have been. And at one level, you might say the saving grace is that in most of our professional functions, actually, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of sort of political interference or in fact, you know, and it's not so much, I mean, the US is different. It's not so much even a kind of anti-expertise or an anti-intellectual moment as much. It actually comes down to two very specific questions, which is one, and David Hollinger has written on the work, which is university work and common national identities. I mean, that seems to be in some senses, I and mean, how do we explain the relationship between what happens in university, especially to an outside public that sees them as corrosive of what it takes to be the fundamentals of kind of common life. Uh, and I think the second one, particularly in the humanities, um, around the sense of the universities as being in some kind of cultural vanguard. I mean, to take Daniel Bell's classification, this in some senses realm of culture. And I think what's interesting there is that I don't think the public sees the professors or students as political threats in the way in which they were in the 1960s that come out do collective action. I think universities are actually pretty de-radicalized. Uh, it's only in the realm of the humanities that in some senses, the very act as it were uh, of making an argument is seen as a kind of you know, performative subversion of a, you know, existing value. And you can see this particularly, I think, in areas of, uh, you know, gender, sexuality, and identity. Uh, and it is quite striking how much of the critique of populist forces always comes down to that little swath of the university, which, you know, is, 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 is important uh, uh, in some ways, uh, but doesn't actually characterize much of what actually happens in the university. Yeah, I might add a footnote, but only a footnote. Um, First, I think there are some countercurrents right now. I, I think the effects of COVID and the climate crisis um, has been to enhance the standing of um, uh, potentially, uh, at least, of expertise and the role of universities um, and researchers. Um, the um, and I think that's an opportunity. Um, second, I think to the to Jenny's question and. Um, both questions really from David as well. I think um, the defense of the university is at its core a defense of liberal democracy. Um, it's the university that brings together um, the, the value of participation and cacophony. Um, the, um, and I think we, we can't apologize uh, for that. Um, it is, it is a truism in any decent democracy that there is no single sense of public interest 
beyond, if you like, the rules of the game. Um, the, the open um, protected rights-based rules of the game. And uh, I think the answer to the, to the um, illiberal populist thrust, not the liberal, there are liberal populist thrusts, but the illiberal populist thrust is to remind um, everyone of uh, how awful it would be to live in a world that looked more like um, uh, Putin's Russia or um, Xi's China in which this, the command of the public interest was so strong, it would be to justify um, oppression um, uh, down the line. Um, we have, um, so defending freedom, defending liberty, uh, defending democracy, but liberal democracy with its values seem to me to be the core essential way to defend the university, but not to erase the cacophony not to erase the debate um, and not to say you'll always be happy with what um, what we as academics have to say to you. Okay, well, that seems like a fitting note on which to conclude our conversation this morning. Um, thank you so much to Pratap Mehta and Ira Kessnelson for joining us this morning. We have recorded the event and we'll be posting it shortly. Um, and I appreciate um, all of you for coming. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to more questions, but it was, at least for me, such a treat to be able to hear uh, these two thinkers um, just talk. So thank you all for coming, um, and, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at our next SSRC event. Thank you, Pratap and Ira. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.